My grandmother left Cuba in 1953, way before the Cuban Revolution. So we don't consider ourselves Cuban exiles. We're, we're Cuban immigrants. I was conceived in Cuba, born in New York, and raised in Boyle Heights. That's very confusing to a lot of people. <laughs> okay? Um, when, I, uh, when we arrived in 1958 to Boyle Heights, I remember that the one place that we rented was, was from a, a Jewish owner. He, he owned a house. Um, but directly across the street, right, understand this, we're the only Cuban family in the neighborhood, and I think we're still the only Cuban family in the neighborhood for the last 50 years, okay? Across the street on Wabash and Thicket, there was a Puerto Rican who owned that market. Next to that was a Mexican-American family who spoke English and broken Spanish. On, on, the, on the other side of the street, there were newly arrived Mexicanos who spoke Sp Spanish primarily. On the southwest corner of Wabash and Thicket, there lived a Japanese American community. If I went down a little further down the street, down to Mott and made a left turn off of Evergreen, there was an African American community. And I grew up in this environment. It wasn't until I got to college that I really didn't understand the nature of the richness that I received from Boyle Heights. I had no idea that I was as rich as I was, and it taught me in very subtle and nuanced ways. Okay? Boyle Heights allowed me to be Cuban. Boyle Heights made me Mexican. Boyle Heights made me African American. Boyle Heights made me understand Jewish and Russian and German people, because I had friends that were called Patapov and Kazimov. Right? Boyle Heights taught me all of that. It was, it was amazing. And I could see how being in that area, how growing up in that area, right, has sort of changed who we were as Cubans. You know, we always talk about, oh, black beans and white rice, but our black beans had chile in them, <laughs> right? They're not like anything that you could purchase anywhere in the world. Only in Boyle Heights, and you gotta ask my mom to do it for you, <laughs> right? I had dreams of saying, I'm gonna go to college, and uh, one of the things I'd like to do is to uh, teach music. And through those years, I would go to a, a program that was called the Saturday Conservatory of Music. And it was a program that was set up by teachers who taught in Boyle Heights, right, to give access to private lessons for students who could not get them paid for, right? So I went there, and so I played some flute, and I continued to do that. Well, when I graduated from Hollenbeck, I said, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I wanna play rock and roll, I wanna play some drums, but I really wanna play football. I really wanna play football. And at that time, I had like a dual identity with all the other identities I had inherited already, okay? Some people knew me because I was a musician and other people knew me because I was a football player, right? But they never put the two together. It's still kind of like that every once in a while, okay? And something happened magical at, at the high school level at Roosevelt, right? All of a sudden, people say, hey man, you're pretty special on the field. Well, what does that mean, coach? He says, you're good. And uh, the opportunity came up to go to a university on a football scholarship. And, and luckily for me, again, right, being in Boyle Heights, um, I had a choice, or choices, right? And it came down to two places, UCLA and USC. And once again, I consulted my elders. All my coaches says, well, son, you know, they're both great programs, but you know, what we do at Roosevelt is we usually go to USC. <laughs> okay? I asked the, the pertinent question, says, well, you know, USC has the best school of music. I said, okay. So that decision is just a slam dunk. So in, while I'm being recruited, I finally meet John McKay, because he was there. They'd just come off winning a national championship and uh, I was sitting in his office, you know, I had a big old maple desk and he was behind smoking a big old huge cigar. And I told him, I said, you know, they make those in Cuba, you know. <laughs> I said, you know, 
I'm here to really get a degree. And he looked at me sort of funny. I said, you know, I, I want to play for you, but I'm here to get a degree. He says, well, what are you interested in? Check this out, music. Oh my God. So he thought, okay, maybe he's a drummer, maybe he's a bass player, maybe he plays a trumpet, maybe he plays a trombone, you know, one of them kind of instruments, right? He says, well, what do you play? I said, the flute. <laughs> kind of a big guy, right? Playing a little tweety thing. <laughs> I know that in his mind he was saying, yeah, right. right? All he wanted me to do was to, to come over. Long story short, I went to SC. And uh, I go through all the standard protocols and process of practicing. And, and I walk into the dean's office. And I say, I, I uh, want to be a music major. And I want to do it within the school of music. He says, well, you know, son, uh, you can't do it within the school of music. You got to do it through the College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. And I said, why? He says, well, because it's highly specialized. And you know, we don't, you know. We normally don't have football players who want to study this kind of music. <laughs> I said, okay, cool, no problem. Here we go, right, 1975. I'm on the dean's list for the first two years through the College Letters, Arts, and Sciences, even though through the School of Music they were essentially the same courses. I wanted a Bachelor in Music. I didn't want a Bachelor of Arts, okay? So I go back two years to the dean, and I say to the dean, so are you going to accept me now? It was amazing because being in that kind of a challenging environment where I was being asked to be a football player at one time and then a musician on the other, right, I had to figure out a way of how I was, how I was going to negotiate these waters and still be successful in both. Right? And I, I understood that the football program was, was paying for my education. But I also understood that I was working pretty hard for it. And one of the things that I learned, right, being at SC at that time, the only kind of music that was of any value at all was European classical music. And I, I would always ask my professors, specifically those professors of history and theory, well, hold on a second, man. How does all the other music I grew up with, which means jazz, Latin jazz, Cuban music, rancheras, I mean, we listened to Pedro Flores and Pedro Infante, okay, and, and, and all the African-American music that I was listening to, right, R&B, and all. I mean, East L.A. was all that, right? I said, hey, that, that music got to count for something. It's music. <clears throat> and I said, you know, I, 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 need to, I need to go to a place, I need to find a program that will actually give me some kind of theoretical, historical, methodological background in explaining the phenomenon of the music I grew up with. So I started doing my research, and lo and behold, just 20 minutes down the, the 10 freeway at UCLA, they have a program in ethnomusicology. Guess where I went? Okay? And it was really interesting, right? The year I started at UCLA, I think the coach was Terry Donahue, they started beating SC all the time. And it has to, I had nothing to do with the program. It has to do with me being on campus. Okay? And... Uh, the next 10 years, I spent the majority of my time doing the research um, on the music of our culture. Okay? And it took me 10 years to do it because there's just not a lot on it, not a lot of literature on it. Um, but once again, I used my critical thinking skills and my creativity to say, okay, well, I will have to create my own source of information. And finally, when uh, I finally wrote my thesis and defended it, um, I was playing European classical music. I played with the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra for 10 years. And that was really funny, because I was the only Latino in the wind section. That was really, really weird, right? You're talking about like feeling like a fly in a big bowl of, on a big pan of milk, right? And it was funny. It was like, you know, this, this guy don't belong here, right? But I was doing my thing, right? Um, and I always wanted to try my hand at teaching. And I had, I had returned to the Saturday Conservatory of Music and taught for 12 years. Uh, one of the things that I did say to myself was, 
You know, what I had to confront as a person, I would never want a person from Boyle Heights to have to confront it if they choose to follow the path of music. Okay? And I said, I was lucky that I had a football scholarship that allowed me to go to this place, to USC, and study. These guys could do the same thing, but they don't have to play football to do it. They can use their instrument to do it. And they did it. Right? So for the 12 years that I was there, right, I had I have to, close to 15 students who all received scholarships, music scholarships, uh, to study chemistry, pharmacy. Some of them did become musicians, but most of them became teachers. Right? And I was thrilled about that. And I thought, well, if I could do this with high school students, could I do it at the college level? And uh, I pursued wanting to just teach the flute, and I wound up at Whittier College. Well, after about four years of being a part-timer and doing the freeway flying thing, I was teaching at the High School for the Arts, teaching at Cal Poly Pomona. They said, you know, we, we need another, another professor here who does what you do, right? And at that time, the music department was getting ready to close up because it just didn't have enough students to validate its existence, and they weren't contributing to the general education part of the curriculum, which is we call liberal education. I said, okay. So I applied, and they had 650 students, uh, professors who applied for the position. And I wound up being on the short list. And then I had to go through an interview process, just like everybody else. It wasn't a, a given thing. And once again, Boyle Heights kicked in, because I was asked a series of questions. But one of the questions was, would you go back and get a PhD? And I was very respectful, and I said, well, you know, I do realize that there are degrees that require that degree uh, as a terminal degree to be able to teach at the collegiate level. I said, but in my case, there isn't a degree on earth that can give me all the music I come with. Okay? That's Boyle Heights, right? That attitude is Boyle Heights, right? And they were having a tough time because I didn't, I, I didn't have that PhD, right? But they said, okay, we'll give you the job. That idea of integrity, that idea of perseverance, that idea of si se puede, right? Um, um, is what I got. And, and I stand here before you, right? But again, once this, this wonderful opportunity came up to not talk about me, right? Because I could talk about me, but not talk about me, but talk about what Boyle Heights actually gave to me, right? And I tell people, I just grew up that way, right? I just grew up that way. So I will always continue to say that Boyle Heights is my home. I live in Whittier, but I've spent more time in Boyle Heights than I do in Whittier, okay? And all I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you. Mil gracias. Mil gracias, right? Because Boyle Heights indeed saved my life. And I'm not different than anybody else here, right? But they, in fact, gave me the confidence, allowed me to thrive, allowed me to grow, and allowed me to do things that perhaps if I'd grown somewhere else, I wouldn't have had, had those opportunities. So thank you very much for uh, asking me to be here this afternoon. Thank you.